For this case study, we're going to be analyzing the Bell Labs case, also known as the Schoen scandal. So our presentation purpose is to provide a brief summary of the case, analyze the ethical violations committed by the co-authors from an engineering perspective, we're going to consider the legal implications under the given circumstances, and we're going to provide a better alternative decision that could have been made by these co-authors. The key actors for this case are Bell Labs, who was the employer, John Hendrick Schoen, who was the main culprit, and the co-authors, who we're going to dive into later. So Jean Hendrik Schoen was a well-renowned researcher for Bell Labs. Uh, he published numerous papers on semiconductors that were shaking up the scientific community. In 2002, however, these papers were found to be falsified. Jean was fired from Bell Labs and revoked of his doctorate degree by his alma mater. So of course Jean needed some help to conduct these experiments, and he had three principal co-authors. They were Jean and Bao, Bertram Batlog, and Christian Clock. Jenin and Christian ran experiments that were later reproduced by Schoen. Bertram Batlog was a leader of the research and actually Schoen's supervisor. According to the investigation committee, these co-authors were cleared of any professional misconduct. But what if these co-authors were engineers? Let's use the Professional Engineering Act to analyze this case. So Christian and Jenin definitely proved to be negligent in working with Jean. However, Jean conducted these experiments separately on his own, and this was the data in which he used in his reports. So we can say that it wasn't their fault, however, they should have been more aware of Jean's misconduct. Bertram's case actually leads to more interesting investigation. Bertram actually noticed that there were exceptional results, and did not insist on thorough validation of the data. He knew that the exceptional results would lead to serious inquiry from the greater scientific community, However, validating the results would have questioned the integrity of the data, and thereby, Jan. This would cross the line of trust. Looking at Bertram's ethical violations, we look at the Engineering Code of Ethics. We can see that he violated Article 77-1 and 77-8. Bertram was neither fair or loyal to his employer, Bell Labs. He didn't show fidelity to public needs, specifically the scientific community and he did not maintain a devotion to high ideals of personal honor and professional integrity. Looking at potential professional misconduct, we see that Bertrand violated Article 72-2. Bertrand was clearly negligent in his actions, and he also signed a document without thoroughly checking it. So some of the alternative decisions Bertrand could have made include Option 1, Bertrand could have validated the results without informing anyone, Option two, Bertram could have validated the results while informing all necessary parties. And option three, Bertram could have done nothing. So analyzing the alternatives, we see that option two commits the least violations and is therefore Bertram's best option. Now let's look at some of the legal implications of the case. Here's a quick refresh of the parties involved. The defendants would be Bell Labs, Dr. Schoen, as well as Bertram, and the plaintiffs would be the scientific community. We can see that this is most likely a tort law case, as no specific contract was breached. Legal precedents include Canimal Constructing v. Huffman and Donahue v. Stevenson. These precedents tell us that even if there was no relationship between parties, the defendants can still be found guilty for incompetence. Looking at the criteria for the tort law case, we can see that all three tests were passed. As a duty of care was owed to the clients, the duty of care was breached, and injury in the terms of time and money spent was caused by the breach. In a scenario where all parties are engineers rather than scientists, there would most likely be a vicarious liability by Bell Labs. And since there are concurrent tort feasors, the judge should determine the level of punishment to each party. There would be potential direct damages, depending on whether money was paid for the papers, as well as nominal damages. And so, the scientific community would win this case.